Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Homeowners and home buyers, please listen closely. In about 14 minutes, the Equitable Society has important news for you. It's about the amazing Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, a money-saving, worry-saving, home-saving plan that combines a low-cost mortgage with life insurance protection. So listen carefully for all the facts about the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, one of the finest services offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file, The Student of Violence. Murder is a crime that is committed under many different circumstances. Sometimes because of passion, other times for profit. Still other killings are perpetrated because of a desire for revenge. But whatever the reason might be, it is always a crime committed by a person with an inflated ego because no one but an egomaniac could possibly believe that he had the right to take the life of another human being. That there are too many such egomaniacs in the United States is a matter of official record. For the files of your FBI revealed that in the past year, there has been an average of more than 37 homicides every day. A figure which, when broken down, reveals that there is a criminal homicide committed every 38 and 8 tenths minutes throughout the day and night. That figure presents a genuine menace to you, the law-abiding citizen, because, as you will see from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, not every criminal homicide finds another criminal as the victim. Very often, it is a decent, unsuspecting citizen who meets death, someone like... You. Tonight's file opens at the White Pine Inn, a popular summer resort. A young, rather attractive girl is at the telephone. Hello, honey boy. This is Olive. Uh-huh. I'm over here at this White Pine Inn. Mm -hmm. Got a little old me a job here yesterday. Yeah, I got you, man. I guess I just got especially lonesome for you after I saw your picture in the paper. With that cute little gal like Miss Patricia something. Uh, start that there. I must say you two made a real cute couple. Huh? Well, I had to come here, honey boy. I had to protect my interests. Oh, no, sugar. I couldn't think of a divorce. I want to keep on being married. You know, Sugar, if I didn't love you, I'd say you want to marry that Scott girl because she's so rich. Huh? Oh, now, really, honey boy. What would you pay me with? Money you got from her? I don't need money that bad. 
Shubra, I'm not interested in a divorce. Sure, I'll meet you where? The boathouse down by the lake? Well, I don't know where it is, but I'll find it. Okay, Shubra. Bye now. nearby city, Sergeant Montgomery, a state trooper, approaches the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor at the FBI field office. Jim, your agent in charge says you might be able to help me on a case I'm working on. He said you know Greene County pretty well. That's right. Well, this thing happened at Lake Beaver. Huh? What's the story on it, Sergeant? Well, I was called in this morning by the manager at the White Pine Inn. He told me one of his waitresses was missing, a girl named Olive Ward. She'd been missing for two days now, and I thought maybe she'd gone home until I searched her room and found a threatening letter. Sergeant, I assume the agent in charge explained to you that we don't have any jurisdiction unless the note was sent to the mail? Yes, he did. Oh, good. This note was sent to the girl at Centerville, New Jersey, where she used to work, and the postmark on the envelope was Lake Beaver. Any signature? Well, just the initial J. I see. No return address on the envelope, of course? No, not a thing on it. Front or back. And it's your feeling that something has happened to the girl, is that right? Yeah, you see, Miss Ward had only worked at the hotel one day, and one of the waitresses told me that she got a phone call that first night she was there, and it was from a man. Any idea on him? No. But after the call, Miss Ward asked her which way it was to the boathouse. That's the White Pine Inn boathouse? Yeah, that's right. She also asked about using a canoe because she said she had a date. As I remember, it used to be that you just took a canoe whenever you wanted it. Well, it's still that way, and obviously Miss Ward and her date used one because it's still missing. That's a pretty big lake to drag, Sergeant. <laughs> it's too big. There used to be a lot of private boats on the lake. Quite a few private planes out at the airport. Yeah, they're still there. Well, we might organize them and start a searching party. I stopped listening to that kind of talk when I was seven. But it is. Come on in. I'll get enough exercise at the dance tonight. Sissy. Hey, by the way, what time do you want me to pick you up? Huh? Well, when should I call for you? Jeff, you're going to murder me. I forgot. What? I forgot about us. I made another date. Well... Can't you break it, Pat? She wouldn't do a thing like that to me. Hi, Johnny. Hi, honey. I should have known her date was with you. Hey, give me a hand, one of you. Here. Here you go. Ah, oh, I've got an idea on how to see which one of you takes me to the dance. Ah, oh, what is it? Well, you're both good swimmers. Have a race. The winner takes me. Okay with me. Hey, look, Pat, I still got this bum shoulder from swimming the other day. I knew you'd pull some kind of an alibi. Hey, now, wait a minute. If that's how you play... Hey. We were all kidding. Well, I'm not going to let... it. I'm going to the dance with both of you. All right, son. Let me give you a hand there. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, here, the coroner came out here. Yo. Yeah, he made a preliminary examination. Said that Miss Ward had been dead for two days. Uh -huh. Where'd you find her? In a small cove the other side of this island. Looked like drowning, but the coroner said she was dead when she hit the water. Marks on her head indicate that she was beaten. Any idea what the weapon was? Not yet. Maybe the lad can tell us, though. Any footprints? Well, some that looked like they belonged to a man and a woman, but they were too indistinct to furnish any impression. Uh -huh. Oh, is that the missing canoe over there? Yeah, no, that's it. Looks like a murderer swam back to shore. Uh -huh. Anything else? Yeah, there was a rather clumsy attempt to remove the labels from Miss Ward's clothes. Leads me to believe this was done by an anarchist. Well, I'd say the most likely suspect is the person who wrote her that threatening note. Yeah, I'll go along with that. And as much as the note was postmarked Lake Beaver, Jim, I think the killer might still be here. Maybe yes, maybe no. We know this girl came out here from Centerville to see somebody. Uh -huh. And we know she was here only one day. Therefore, it's my assumption that whoever wrote the letter knew her in Centerville. I see. And it's probable that while the actual murder took place here at Lake Beaver, the motive is back in Centerville, too. Sounds good to me. Sergeant, I think I'll fly back there and see what I can find out. <laughs> Something, Pat. I thought 
this was never going to happen. Why, Tony? Dancing with you. I've been trying for hours. I haven't been trying very hard. Honey, every time I even started for you, off you'd go with another guy with a crew haircut. <laughs> That's not true. Well, now that I've got you, I'm not going to lose you. Come on. Huh? Just come with me. Go ahead, honey. Yes. A little less competition out here on the terrace. Mm-hmm. May I have a Sure, honey. Here. Pat, I had a reason for bringing you out here. Mm-hmm. It has to do with you and Jeff. Well? I never really knew Jeff, although we did go to the same school at the same time, but I know some fellas who are friends of his. They all think Jeff's a real nice guy. Johnny, what's this all about? Well, I think you ought to marry him. Huh? Mm -hmm. You're both nice guys. You'll be happy with it. Look, answer one thing for me. Is it John in your name for John Alden? I'm serious, Pat. I am, too. If you're not John Alden, stop imitating me. Pat, you're engaged to the guy. We were engaged. Huh? Gave him back his ring last week. Oh, I didn't know that. I was telling you all this about marrying him, I mean, because I wanted to bow out gracefully. Johnny, I don't want you to. Huh? I don't want you to bow out. come out in this canoe. Been on the lake for ten minutes and I'm tossed out. What's the matter with you? I... Well, I saw you go out in the carriage with Johnny. Oh. What happened to us, Pat? Oh, I don't know, Jerry. You went away to finish college. Well, I guess maybe I grew up. Pat, I still want to marry you. I'm afraid you're too late. Well, what do you mean? Johnny asked me to marry him tomorrow. Yeah. You didn't accept it. Yes, I did. But you can't. Please, Jeff. I, I... I won't let you. Jeff, take me back to the bed. No. Jeff. Well, I'm not taking you back until you listen to me. You can't marry him. I won't let you do it. Jeff, sit down. I've got to tell you something first. Jeff, you're tipping the canoe to come. No. You're going to listen to me. Jeff, look out. Jeff! We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. Protection against mortgage foreclosure. A plan that has made it possible for thousands of homeowners to have a mortgage-burning celebration like this. All right, Peggy. You strike the match. Now, light the mortgage at this end. There she goes. Look at her burn. No more mortgage at our home. We own it free and clear. Yes, it's an old American custom to burn a canceled mortgage. And when you have an equitable society assured home ownership plan, the great day when the mortgage is paid up often comes much sooner than you originally expected. This money-saving, home-saving plan combines a low-cost first mortgage with special life insurance protection. Thanks to the life insurance side of this plan, a special cash fund is built up. It's always ready for use if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. As the mortgage shrinks, this cash fund increases. For example, it can be used to pay off a 20-year mortgage in approximately 15 years. In addition, the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan protects the home against the greatest hazard of all, the death of the breadwinner. In the Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the owner dies, the Equitable Society cancels the mortgage. It's paid off in full. What's more, every dollar previously paid under the plan to reduce the principal is returned to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Last but not least, 
the mortgage interest is only 4%. And there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer fees, and other closing costs. So all in all, a man is very fortunate. If his health, age, income, home, and its location qualify him for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. The way to find out if you qualify is to get in touch with your Equitable Society representative. Look in the phone book or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Student of Violence. In many respects, murderers are like all other criminals. And perhaps the most pointed similarity is that they do not necessarily look like criminals. A killer can be male or female. If he is a male, he can be tall or short, strong or weak, very masculine or quite a feat. And he may breathe fire or be as meek as a one-day-old kitten. There are no blueprints which describe what a criminal must look like. And the actual fact of the matter is that many people who commit crimes look as if they might be frightened by a dark room at night. Human beings are complex mechanisms, and they are capable of the most heartwarming kindnesses, the utmost gentility, and the ultimate in courage. But by the same token, they are also capable of the basest treachery, the infinite in cruelty, and the wanton disregard of the laws which have been written in order to ensure the continuation of civilization. Yes, human beings can reach the heights of nobility or the depths of reckless immorality. And the truly terrifying thing is that sometimes both can be reached by the same person. Tonight's file continues at the State Trooper Barracks in the office of Sergeant Montgomery. Now, Jim, are you back from Centerville already? I got in about 15 minutes ago. How'd you make out? Well, I don't know yet myself. I checked on Olive Ward's background. How'd you get anything? Well, she'd been in Centerville about six or eight months. She came there from Spartanburg, Alabama, and got a job as a waitress at one of the sandwich shops, a place that caters to the college crowd. Well, a pretty girl must have fit into a place like that. Oh, from what the proprietor told me, she didn't make too many dates. Oh? Yeah, and then he said that a couple of months ago, she got married to one of the boys from the school. Hey, that could be the lead we're looking for, Jim. What I thought, except neither the proprietor nor anyone else seems to know whom she married. The only thing I could find out is that when he graduated, he left her. But there must have been a marriage license filed. Well, it's not on record in Centerville or in any of the surrounding towns. I see. No, one other thing. I got a warrant and I went to the rooming house where the girl used to live. Finally, they gave me this ring. Huh? Yeah, take a look at it. Thanks. She said Miss Ward left it there when she moved out. It's a graduation ring. The new one's on it there, 46. Uh-huh. Well, there are initials inside. Yeah, those are her initials, O.W. I went back to the sandwich shop, asked the proprietor if he had ever seen the ring before. He said he had. On her? Yes, he said that she used to wear it. That's when he told me that she came from Spartanburg. Well, what do you do now, Jim? Well, Sergeant, I think I'll fly down to Spartanburg and see what I can pick up. Maybe that's where the answer to this case is. <laughs> Mr. Johnny, the doctor doesn't want anyone to stay with Miss Scott too long this morning. Well, then I won't even bother going in. Oh, he said it was all right for you. She's been asking for you. Oh, thanks. Johnny? Uh Uh-huh. Come in. How do you feel, honey? Better, thank you. You had me scared there for a while last night. You must have swallowed an awful lot of water. I don't even remember swimming ashore. You didn't? Well, then how did... I was on the shore. I jumped in and pulled both of you out. Jeff, too? Yeah. He wasn't doing much swimming when I got to him. He said later that he was hit on the head with the point of the canoe when it turned over. I see. Darling, I don't have to tell you how grateful I am. Oh, stop, honey. I'm just glad you... you're here. Johnny. Yes, dear? I thought last night with Jeff. Yeah? 
I don't know how to say this. Maybe it's just my imagination. When I told Jeff that we were going to be married, well, it almost looked as if he turned the canoe over on purpose. <laughs> Hello. Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you sleeping? Oh, so was dark. I, I came over to apologize. I see. And I, I know that it's impossible to undo what I've already done, and I, I know I made a complete fool of myself. But when you said you were going to marry Johnny, I, I just lost my head. Let's drop it, Jeff. We're both sorry it happened. Let it go at that. Yes, but there was something I wanted to tell you. Before I say it, though, I, I want you to know that I... And this has nothing to do with the fact that you said no to me. What are you trying to say, Jeff? Pat, did you see the newspaper yesterday? Yes. Did you see a story about a waitress from the White Pine Inn? Yes, I did. Her picture was in the paper, too. I know. I remember that girl, Pat. She used to work in a hamburger place in Centerville. All of the fellows at school used to be there. Oh? Last spring, after exams are over, I went away for a couple of days of golf and rest. I went up to a lodge in the mountains near school. While I was there, I saw Johnny and his girl together. Was that so awful? Sure, Johnny had dates before. This wasn't the date, Pat. They were registered as Mr. and Mrs. Buchanan. What? According to the newspaper, the man they're looking for, the man they think is the murderer, is the girl's husband. Jeff Clinton, this is the dirtiest thing I ever heard of. Accusing Johnny of murder. You get out of here. But it's only fair to tell you when I leave here, I'm going to the police. You're going to tell them that story? Oh, I've got to. Haven't you the courage to confront Johnny with this? Sure. I'll be glad to. Then come back at six. I'll have Johnny here. <laughs> Hi, Sarge. Hello, Jim. You just got in ahead of the storm. Yeah. Did you find the answers in Spartanburg? Well, not all of them, but some. I got there and looked up the name Ward in the phone book. There yeah. were 33 of them. I checked every single one. None of them knew the girl. Oh, fine. So I went to the Board of Education and checked through their records. No one named Olive Ward graduated from any school in 1946. Maybe the ring threw us off. No, it finally worked out. I, I kept thinking about that ring and how it might help us, and I finally came up with the right answer. What was that? Well, I figured that if she graduated in 1946, then her picture should be in one of the school's yearbooks. Yeah. So I checked the ring to see which school it was made for. I looked through their yearbook and finally found her picture. <laughs> I don't understand, Jim. You just said that the Board of Education didn't have any Olive Ward on their records. Well, that's because her name wasn't Olive Ward. She graduated as Olive Warcheski. She was a Polish girl. Oh, I see. Apparently, she has no relatives left in Spartanburg because I couldn't find any other Warcheskis in the city. I even checked all the voting records. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Hello. Sergeant McCumber speaking. Oh, yes, just a minute. For you, Jim. Oh, hi. Hello. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Will you... Wait a minute while I write that down. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Thanks very much. Sergeant, here's the answer we've been looking for. Who was that? That was the license bureau at Blackport. That's a little town near Centerville. A lot of college kids go there to be married, so I wired them and asked them to check their records. Well, did they find the name of the man who married Olive Ward? Yeah. Well, let's get a warrant and close this case. <laughs> Cigarette, Pat? No, thanks. How about a drink? Not right now. Pat, is anything bothering you? Honey, I... I've been trying to think of a way to slide into an unpleasant subject. You haven't changed your mind about us, have you? No. Well, then, what is it, honey? Jeff Clinton was over this afternoon. Oh? He told me a horrible story. What was it, an alibi for last night? No. He said that... 
You said that you knew that waitress from the hotel who was found dead this week. He said I knew her? Yes. He, he said she used to work in a restaurant in Centerville. Did you know? Boy, I might have said good evening to her a couple of times when I went down to have a late hamburger. But I didn't even know her name. Oh, I'm glad. Why? Oh, Jeff said that you went away for a weekend with her and that you were registered as man and wife. Oh, that's the biggest schoolboy trick I ever heard that's of. That's what I told him. And I'm very pleased that you can tell him he's a liar when he comes here. He's coming back? Yes, he said he'd be here by six. Well, what do you bet he doesn't show up? Well, he said he would. Oh, I know that guy, Pat. I know how he operates. Well, this time he isn't going to get away with it. I'm going to find him and make him come here and tell you he was lying. Wait, Johnny, he could be on his way. I don't want to wait. I want to clear this up now. That's a good idea, Johnny. Huh? Jeff. Let's clear up the whole thing. Oh. You mean that phony story you told her? It isn't phony, Johnny. You know that. He didn't even know the girl, Jeff. Let him speak for himself, Pat. Sure. I didn't know that girl any better than you did, Jeff. I didn't even know her name until I saw her picture in the paper. You're a liar. Oh, look. Will you go to the police with me? Certainly. I'll go, won't you, Johnny? No. What? Well, I don't have to prove myself to you, do I? If you've got nothing to hide, why are you afraid of the police? Well, look, look I've heard enough of this. You, you get out of here, Jeff. I'll get out when you come with me. Johnny, why don't you go with him? Pat, are you on his side? Johnny, all I'm trying to do You're is... You're trying to frame me. John. I didn't know that girl. John, I saw Shut you. Shut up. I'm leaving here now, and I'm leaving alone. Johnny, honey, what are you doing? Stay where you are. <laughs> all of you, Cannon. Huh? All more. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. All right, Buchanan, you're coming with me. John Buchanan was turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted him on the charge of first-degree murder. Special Agent Taylor was able to apprehend the homicidal maniac in tonight's case because he learned that John Buchanan had married the waitress, Olive Ward. That clue led to a search of Buchanan's room, which revealed two things. One, the typewriter which had been used to write the threatening letter, and two, the labels which had been torn from the clothing of the dead girl. When confronted with that evidence, Buchanan broke down and confessed, and thus another FBI file was closed. Yes, this file was closed. And closed successfully because a special agent would not give up his relentless pursuit of every possible clue. A pursuit which led ultimately, as it invariably does, to the killer. There are many copybook maxims which you see applied in your everyday life. Maxims which tell simple truths in simple language. One maxim seen in their everyday work by members of your FBI is the one which reads... Murder will out. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Friends, if you were impressed a few minutes ago by what I told you about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, if the idea appeals to you of a low-interest-rate first mortgage combined with life insurance to protect your home against death and hard times, then I suggest that you get in touch with your Equitable representative soon. He'll show you exactly what this plan will do for you personally, how much money it can save you, how much added security it will give you. So contact your Equitable Society representative without delay or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A colorful story of a manhunt on the Western Plains. Its subject, draft evasion. Its title, The Hollywood Horseman. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. 
Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Hollywood Horseman on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Perhaps you are one of the thousands of men and women who has recently received a postcard or a telephone call from your Equitable Society representative. Please be sure to listen to the middle commercial on the Equitable program Friday night, your Equitable representative told you. It's an important message for men and women who want to continue to be self-supporting after they're 60 years old. That's why the Equitable Life Assurance Society calls it the Independent 60s Plan. I'll give you further information in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Hollywood Horseman. In at least one respect, nations are like children, for the growth of either depends on a combination of things. Ours is a young, growing country, but its continued growth may very well be dependent upon our conquering the crime wave. In the minds of many who have studied our social structure, there is grave doubt that a nation can long continue healthy, which sees a major crime committed within its borders every 18 and 9 tenths seconds. Every hour throughout the past year has seen the commission of crime after crime until, at the year's end, the total showed that an average of 12 felonious assaults or murders took place every 60 minutes. Those are figures to give pause to the most carefree among us. For if it was true when Abraham Lincoln said that this nation could not long exist part slave and part free, then it is even truer today that we cannot long continue with the army of criminals growing larger every hour. Tonight's file opens high in one of the mountains that have run through our western states. A young man and woman are riding horseback along a lonely trail as storm clouds gather threateningly overhead. Looks to me like it's fixing to rain, ma'am. I hope it does. Why is that? Maybe then the clouds will go away and we'll get that real western right. sunshine. I just can't go home without a tan. Well, if it starts to rain, ma'am, it'll rain hard. Oh, out there. Reckon maybe we better head back to the ranch. Oh, no, Earl, please, let's not go back. I want to see this country. We don't have anything like this back east. Don't reckon you do. Get them. Earl, how long have you been working at the dude ranch? A couple months. You wouldn't know my friend, Sonny Collier. She stayed there last summer. No, ma'am, I wouldn't. That's how we happened to hear about the place. Well, I'm mighty happy you did, ma'am. Beat it, boy. Come on. Beat it. Hey, I think I just felt a drop of rain. Yeah, I reckon it's not going to hold off no longer. Should we ride through it? No, there's a cave a little yonder. We can take shelter there. We're we can't just we... stay there till it stops raining. Now, come on. Beat it, boy. Come on. Just round the bend. Ooh, look at it come down now. Yeah, hey, you're getting soaked. I don't mind. Cave's right ahead here now. Uh, there it is. Come. Oh, oh. It's really wet. Well, boy. All right, boy. Yeah, here we are. All right. Good rain. Oh. Yeah, let me help you down, oh, man. 
thank you. We can take the horses in with us. Here's the entrance right here. Follow me, ma'am. All right. Shelly here. Well, this is it. Gosh, it's a scary-looking place. We won't have to stay in here long. That rain will quit real soon, and we'll get going. You're not going any place. Huh? Put up your hands, both of you. Later that day, in a state police barracks, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is greeted by Sergeant Howard Woods. Jim, I didn't expect to be seeing you this soon. Oh, I made a lucky plane connection, Howard. Your wire said that you spotted one of those draft evaders we have listed in the circular. Uh-huh. Charlie Baker. We're looking for his brother Pete, too, you know. I know. But they weren't in town together. Huh. Charlie Baker was spotted by the marshal yesterday coming out of a liquor store. Baker pulled a gun, shot the marshal, and fled into the hills. Uh, was the marshal badly wounded? No, he'll be okay. You're sure of the ident? Yes, the marshal was positive. Oh, I see. We chased him as long as we could, but we had to stop when it got dark. Yeah, it's hard enough finding somebody in these woods when it's light, Jim. And at night, it's just about impossible. Was the search resumed this morning? Yes, every trooper we could spare is out, but there are not enough manpower for a job like this, I'm afraid. Have you been with the searchers, Howard? Yes, until about noon today. Then I had to go over to a place called the Bar E Z Dude Ranch. They reported that a young girl who's staying there and one of the hired hands are both missing. So I had to set up a searching party for them. Looks like you're in the searching party business. <laughs> I think it's all right. Howard, do you suppose the Baker brothers have been hiding up in those hills since the middle of the war? Mm, could have been. Well, it's a long time to stay in those woods. Well, if they had enough ammo, they could get plenty of food to keep them going. Yeah, that's true. Oh, excuse me. Certainly. Sergeant Wood speaking. Hey, yes, Clayton. You have? Where? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right, keep searching and report back in an hour. That was one of our men, Jim. He's found the missing ranch girl's purse in a cave up in the mountains. No. He also reported there were signs of a struggle inside the cave. No trace of the girl? No. Well, Howard, if she was with one of the hired hands... I'm and... not worrying about him, Jim. My concern is that the cave is in the direction that Charlie Baker took after shooting the marshal. Charlie, wake up. Come on, boy. Come on. Get up. Come on. What time is it? Four o'clock. In the morning? No. The afternoon. When'd you get home? Sometime last night. I had trouble. Somebody see you? Uh huh. Where? In town. When? Yesterday afternoon. I told you never to go into town during the day. I needed whiskey. You could have waited. I was thirsty. What happened? Cop spotted me. I shot him. Kill him? I don't know. I think so. If you didn't, they'll be looking for us real good. Where's the whiskey? Left it in the cave. After all that trouble? I didn't mean to get into trouble, Pete. Uh, you never mean it. And there's something else. What? I brought back some folks. Huh? A guy and a dame. You brought them here? Yeah. Why? Well, I get chased out of town. I really dig for it. I headed for one of the caves on Pine Slope. I was hiding there, and they come in. I thought they were the law, so I stuck them up. But why did you bring them back here? Well, I couldn't let them go, could I? Why'd you kill them? I was afraid it'd make too much noise. Oh. Where are they? Out in the shed. And they're tied up. You know who they are? Well, I didn't ask them. Should I kill them now? No. Let's eat something first. You could untie my hand, then I could let you loose. Can't move my fingers that much, ma'am. Well, where's your knife? 
Reckon I don't have one. I never heard of a cowboy without a knife. You have now, ma'am. Look, how would this work? When that man comes back, I'll get him over on one side of the room, and then you could sneak up behind him and knock him down. That man carries a gun, ma'am. I'd always heard cowboys weren't afraid of guns. You heard wrong, ma'am. But you could even... Look, I ain't a hankering to get my brains beat out, none. I, uh... Oh, I guess I might as well drop it. What? This act. I'm no cowboy. Huh? I'm a movie cowboy. Look, what are you talking about? I'm an actor. All this shucks, ma'am, and I reckon that's all phony. I never talked like that until I got to Gower Street in Hollywood. You mean that you were just a cowboy in the movies? Mm Mm-hmm. I was in 11 of those outdoor epics. Oh. You never heard of me. I wasn't a star. I was just the guy who said they went that away, Sheriff. But, well, how come you're working at the Dude Ranch? It's a job. I wasn't going any place in pictures, and I'm not getting any younger, so I decided to see if I could sell my acting experience to people like you who wouldn't know the difference between me and a real cowboy. That's just dandy. I'm sorry. Now I guess we'll have to stay here forever. No, we'll get out. How? I don't think this guy is as tough as he pretends to be. How do you know? It's a matter of typecasting. He looks too much like the villain. Oh, look, Earl, this is real life, not Hollywood. I think... Wait. Well, have you come to let us out? No. Just just want to see if you're still tied up. We are. I'll see for myself. Look, when are you going to let us out of here? I can't rightly say. I'd be willing to pay you if you let us go. I'd be willing to give you $100. I have to talk to my brother about that. Well, when will you talk to your brother? That's my business. I'll see you later. Jim, ever since we found that empty whiskey bottle up at the cave, I had the feeling Baker might have killed a couple. Well, the prints on the bottle might not be Baker's. No, that Bagley's brew is an unusual brand, Jim. Come on. That's the kind the liquor store man said Baker bought. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, it seems to me that if Baker was going to kill him, he'd have done it at the cave. Maybe. Come on, Lolly. Come on. Hey, tell me. Could we spot anything in these woods from the air? No, not very much. I flew over this part with a forest service ranger a couple of weeks ago. All you can see is the tops of trees. Oh. They picked a real cozy hideout for themselves. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All right. Isn't it logical to assume that anybody building a cabin or a shack in these woods would build it near the trail? Yeah, that's right. Well, then maybe we could send one man up each of the trails. See if we can get a lead that way. We're riding on the only trail there is. Huh? Well, that takes care of that idea. Hey, maybe this is the way. We're right in the middle of the hunting season, aren't we? Uh Uh-huh. Well, can anybody hunt here or do you have to get a license? Uh, It'll cost you two dollars down at the county courthouse. Well, suppose we ask every hunter who gets a license to keep an eye out for the bakers or for the missing couple. They'll all be armed. It won't be like asking somebody to take a chance without a gun. That might be a help, Jim. Well, it's the best I can come up with at the moment. Steady up, boys. As soon as we get back to town, let's stop by the courthouse. You think the man's ever coming back? Sure. He'll let us out, too. I wish I felt that confident. You would if you worked in as many pictures as I did. These Western things always have a happy ending. You just wait and see. Here it is. Uh, This here is my brother. Oh. Hello. Hello. Well, did you talk to him? Uh huh. Did you tell him I'd pay $100? Uh huh. Well, will he let us go? Uh huh. What did I tell you, miss? Oh. My brother wants to talk. You go ahead, Pete. You say you'd give $100 if we let you go? That's right. 
Well, if you can pay a hundred, you can pay a lot more. Oh, she can. Shut up. We want to get out of here, too. But we need some money to get where we want to go. Well, I'll give it to you. We want $3,000. What? You heard him. But look, I haven't got that much money. Then think of where you can get it. You better think fast, too, Lee. Look, why don't you two jokers stop? You're just like the villains in a bad B picture. I've been in movies where they throw you two bums out for being hammy. Now, come on. Untie these ropes. This ain't no movie, mister. We mean business. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Uh, independent 60s? What does that mean? It's very simple, Bob. You're 60 years old or 65. You've retired and you're completely self-supporting, 100% independent. That's the goal of every self-respecting American, Bob. After all... Who wants to spend the end of his life as a dependent on relatives or charity? Oh, I certainly don't. To one man, independent 60s means boarding a train every November and heading for the sunny south. No more long, cold winters for us, Margaret. To another, independent 60s means catching up with all the fishing he missed in his busy years. Yes, every man has his own dreams. And, Bob, whatever yours may be, don't just trust to luck to make that dream come true. Start right now by investigating the famous Independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, what's the good of investigating something I probably can't afford? I'm not made of money, you know. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Bob, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an Independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Hollywood Horseman. FBI, in helping to bring you this series of radio programs, hopes that through them you may learn something of the habits, the morals, and the behavior patterns of criminals. For this is a crime prevention program, and the only way to have you help prevent crime is to make you so familiar with criminals that you will not only abhor them, you will understand their sometimes complex mechanisms. The criminals you see in tonight's FBI file have one thing in common with most other lawbreakers, and that is a contempt for the moral standards by which most of us live. To them, the commandment which says that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor anything that is thy neighbor's, means less than nothing. Criminals do not break the Ten Commandments, because for the most part, they do not even recognize the existence of those rules for decent living. If they did recognize the code, they would not so often break the simple unadorned commandment, thou shalt not kill. Tonight's file continues early the next morning at the office of Sergeant Woods. Howard, I stopped by the courthouse on the way in. We've got three volunteer deputies already. Mm, good. Have been any other word? Not a thing. We resume searching at dawn, but nobody's reported in with a single lead. Mm. You know, after seeing those hills again, I think the only chance we've got of finding them is getting a lucky break. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Oh, uh, Mr. Phillips is giving every applicant for a hunting license a set of pictures of the Baker brothers. Good. Maybe we'll get a lead that way. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Sergeant Woods speaking. Yes. You have? 
We'll bring him back here immediately. That was one of our men, Jim. He's out at the dude ranch. Earl Douglas, the missing hired hand, just rode in a couple of minutes ago. Alone. <laughs> Later, this Charlie and his brother came in to see us. They said they were in trouble. They wanted three thousand dollars to let Mitt Sedgwick go. They crossed the state line. That's kidnapping, Jim. That's right, Howard. Well, go on, please. I told them not to pay, and they slugged me. Well, they weren't so anxious to fight when they were drafted. The Sedgwick promised to pay them, so this morning they blindfolded me, and Charlie led me and my horse part way down the mountain. Then he took off the blindfold and told me to go ahead. Well, where to? Back to the dude ranch to get the money from Miss Sedgwick's parents. I see. Then I'm supposed to meet Charlie tonight the fork in the trail near the cave. Was that all? No, sir. I heard them say last night that they weren't going to release Miss Sedgwick. They're just going to take the money and run. You say you couldn't lead us back up to that cabin? No, sir, I couldn't. I was blindfolded when we got there and blindfolded when I left. Mm -hmm. Have you spoken to the girl's parents yet? No, sir. As soon as I got back to the ranch, a trooper got me and brought me in here. I see. Howard, the first thing we've got to do is see Miss Sedgwick's parents. All right, Jim. We can't make a move now without their permission. They have to be advised of everything we know, and then they've got to make up their minds about the ransom. But even if they pay, Miss Sedgwick won't be returned. We'll tell that to them and see what they say. Well, come on. Let's get out there and find out what they want us to do. I just was in to see the girl. Well? Well, she's beefing. About what? Not eating. That's too bad. She said she ain't had nothing since yesterday morning. She'll live. I, I should have told that guy to bring me back a bottle of whiskey. When you get the cash, we'll get whiskey. If we get the cash. We'll get it. Well, that guy might not come back. He'll be there. Maybe he never went back to the ranch. I tell you, he'll be there. Well, suppose he ain't. You come back here, we'll take off anyway. What about her? I got that figured, too. We'll kill her. Oh, I just spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Sedgwick. She's in pretty bad shape. I can understand that. The doctor had to give her something to put her to sleep. Mr. Sedgwick said for us to do whatever we thought was best. Is he willing to pay the money, Mr. Taylor? Yes, Earl. I explained the whole thing to him. I told him the FBI policy was to ensure the safety of the victim before trying to arrest the kidnappers. I also told him what you told us. You mean about them not releasing her even after they got the money? That's right. Mr. Sedgwick wanted us to make all decisions. Well, all we can do now is keep him posted on development. What do we do, Jim? You got any notions? I don't know how well it'll work, but I've got an idea. Earl, where are you supposed to meet Baker? In the meadow, just beyond the cave he was hiding in. When? At nine tonight. We can surround that meadow at night, Jim, and Baker never know it. I know, Howard, but that wouldn't get Miss Sedgwick back. That's our main objective right now. Earl, you go out and meet Baker tonight. Now, I never saw you in a movie, so I don't know how you were, but this is going to be the biggest role you ever had, and if you're good at it, you can save Miss Sedgwick's life. <laughs> Scared? I didn't know you were here. Now, Pete told me to leave the horse a little way up the trail, just in case you'd come with a cop. Where's the money? I haven't got it. You... Pete told you what had happened to the girl if you didn't bring the dough. I know, but her family don't believe she's still alive. Sure she's alive. I seen her myself just before I left. They want some proof. How are we going to prove she's alive without me bringing her back? They want a letter from her in her handwriting. And then they'll pay? Uh-huh. Pete ain't gonna like this. I can't get the money for you without the letter. What happens after you get the letter? I come down, give it to Mr. Sedgwick, and get the money. 
That means I gotta come down here again tomorrow to meet you? They said to tell you either you do it this way or you get nothing. Pete told me to get the money and bring it back to the house. Now you ain't got the money. I guess I gotta bring you back. Go ahead. Hey, Pete. Pete. Okay, Charlie. Now, let me take that blindfold off. I didn't think you'd be... Hey, what's he doing here? I didn't bring the money. Why not? They want she should write a letter saying how she's okay. They don't believe she's alive. Didn't you tell them she was? I didn't know whether you'd killed her after I left or not. Now we gotta wait another whole day. Do I get the letter or do I go back and say she can't write? I don't like this. I told you Pete wouldn't like it, didn't I? Shut up a minute, Charlie. Try to figure out what kind of a game this guy's playing. What's the answer, huh? I'm not playing any game. You're a liar! If my... Now, what is it? If my hands weren't tied, I'll let you... Lift them up, Charlie. I'm gonna work this... Hold it, both of them! Huh? Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. I'll get warrants here for your arrest. You stupid dope. You let him tail you here. Nobody tailed him. He's right, Baker. We didn't tail you. We didn't have to. Charles and Peter Baker were convicted and sentenced to 25 years in prison for draft evasion and violation of the Federal Kidnapping Act. Special Agent Jim Taylor was able to follow the trail of Charlie Baker and Earl Douglas because as that pair made their way up the mountain to the cabin, Douglas dropped bits of phosphorescent paper which had been given to him by Taylor. Upon reaching the cabin, they found the Sedgwick girl unharmed. And thus, your FBI was able to close another file, a file which had been on the books for five long years. While it is the hope of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to close every case as soon as possible, time is never the deciding factor. Every file remains open as long as the criminal remains free, even if that period stretches, as it did once, to 16 years. There are still more criminals at large this very evening who have violated some federal statute under FBI jurisdiction, but wherever they may be, they can be certain of one thing. Your FBI is still searching for them. And before too long a time elapses, there will be a knock on the door a knock which every criminal has learned to fear. The knock of an FBI special agent with a warrant for arrest. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Well, Mr. Keating, I'm 26 years old. Shouldn't I wait a few years before I start one of these plans? Your Equitable representative will tell you that the sooner you start, the lower the yearly cost will be. Being young gives you an advantage. Well, what about life insurance I already have? Your Equitable representative will explain exactly how it fits in. Well, what income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story describing the relentless pursuit of two professional gun runners. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, the Curious Cargo. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. 
This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Cargo on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few days, Uncle Sam's letter carriers have been delivering thousands of postcards mailed by Equitable Society representatives. Friday night on This Is Your FBI, these postcards say, the Equitable Life Assurance Society is going to give eye-opening information about its famous Independent 60s plan. That's a practical, workable plan for men and women who want to be financially independent after reaching the age of 60. So listen carefully when I give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Cargo. qualitative differences between criminals. Some of them are important from the point of view of society's fight against crime, and some of them are harmless irritants. But perhaps the greatest criminal of them all is the man who schemes to send people, other people, into war. For him, there are no words to describe the depths of his conscience. Indeed, the probability is that he has no such thing. For no man with a semblance of human charity could plan to inflict bloodshed upon others for his own personal profit. And yet there are such people. To name Hitler would be to name the obvious. But there are others. Others who do not regard themselves as leaders or statesmen, but who are interested in the carnage they cause because to them, the bigger the battle, the bigger the profit. They can see in a war only the long rows of dollar signs and never the even longer rows of plain white wooden crosses. Tonight's file opens in a neat waterfront cottage located in a small fishing village along the southern California coast. An elderly woman is tidying the living room as the front door opens. Rings on my fingers. Toes, elephants to ride upon. Wayne, what My in the world? Little Irish rose. Wayne, put me down. <laughs> Stop this nonsense. Have you been drinking? Drinking? Not a drop. Then what's got into you? I got a ship, Mary. What? I got me a ship. Oh, that's wonderful, Wayne. <laughs> tell me all about it. It happened all of a sudden, Mary. Well, tell me. Uh, well. I went down to the wharf this morning, like usual. Yes. Sat around a while. Then I went over to Ned's lunchroom for a bowl of soup. Yes. There was a fellow there. Uh, Ned introduced me. Said he was looking for a skipper. Uh-huh. I talked to him. He hired. Oh, goodness. My regular pay, too. Have you seen the boat? No, he's taken me to see her this afternoon. But from his description, is just like the old Mary Ann. Mm. Who is this man who hired you? Her name's uh, Finney, Joe Finney. Never seen him before. Well, when does he want to ship out? Soon as she's fit. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Finney said if the trip was successful, he'd guarantee me $300 extra. Oh, my. When I get that money, we'll pay the back rent. Then we'll be even with the world. Oh, Wayne, I can't believe it. 
Say, dinner ready yet? Oh, just about. Well, let's go in and sit down at the captain's table. Joe? Yeah. Where have you been? I bought the supplies. All of them? Uh-huh. When are they going to deliver them to the boat? They're on the boat already. That's what kept me. Oh. I got something else done, Pete. What? I got us a captain. Who is he? An old guy named Stevens. Any good? Well, I asked around about him. Nobody put in a knock. Well, that sounds all right. When's he coming down to the boat? Four o'clock. I want to be there. Sure. What did you tell him the boat was used for? Fishing. Did he believe it? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we're in business. In a nearby city at the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is standing by the teletype machines as Agent Mark Butler approaches. Catching up on news, Jim? Hmm? Oh, hi, Mark. Hi. Well, the San Francisco office is going to try to pick up the last member of that Jackson gang today, and I was just wondering whether anything came in on it. Well, did it? No, not yet. Are you going back to your office now? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, I was just in to see the boss. He told me to work with you on the government property case. Oh, fine. Fine, I can use the help. What's the story on it? Well, come on, I'll show you the files. Good. I'll tell you as much of it as I can remember. There's been a series of thefts from a bonded warehouse here in town. You've probably heard about it. Yes. Well, there's some reason to believe that they're all the work of the same persons. Why is that, Jim? Well, everything they've stolen has disappeared. Mm. Now, the way I figure, if this were the work of a large organized mob, they'd steal the stuff and get rid of it. None of this stuff has ever turned up. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Thanks. Has anybody seen the thieves, Jim? Well, we have a report that two men were seen leaving the warehouse one night last week, but before they could be identified, they ran. Oh. Let's see, uh... Oh, here it is. Here's the file on it. It mainly contains evidence against the one known suspect in the case, a watchman at the warehouse named Dillon. Well, how did he come into the case? Well, in a couple of instances, it appeared as if the thieves had been let into the building. No marks indicating forcible entrance were ever found. Uh, you've interviewed Dillon? Yeah, I had a long talk with him three days ago. He protested his innocence, told me a long story to prove that he had nothing to do with the thefts. Well, how did the story stand up? It didn't. I checked the facts and found a number of instances where Dillon simply hadn't told the truth. Have you questioned him since? Well, I went to his rooming house this morning to talk to him. What did he say? Nothing. He was dead. Oh. What happened? He committed suicide. Hmm. Any repenting notes? No. No, but I'd say a suicide amounts to a confession. Mm, more than likely. I did find something in his room that has me puzzled, though, Mark. What was that, Jim? Well, it was a notebook with a lot of phone numbers. No names, just phone numbers. I'm having the switchboard get me a name and address on every number now. Oh, that should give us some kind of a lead. Yeah. As soon as I get the list back, Mark, we'll split it up and go to work. Which boat is it, Joe? Uh, our next one down. I can't tell one from the other. They all look alike. And they all smell alike, too. You know, Pete, if we're traveling a thousand miles in that scow, we ought to have it perfumed or something. I think that we... Hey. What? Somebody's on our boat. Come huh? on. How do we get on it? Just jump down. Oh, okay. Oh, oh it's him. Who? The captain I hired. Hi. I got here early. Thought I'd look around. Uh, Captain, this is Mr. Jones, my partner. Hello, Mr. Jones. Hello, Captain. Well, how do you like the boat? Looks mighty trim. How much of it did you see? Just above decks. Haven't been below yet. Oh. Uh, Mr. Jones, I told the captain we wanted to go out when the rest of the fishing boats do. Good. If it's albacore you're after, they'll be running real soon. You uh, know this coast good, do you, Captain? Like the palm of my hand. Well, fine. Oh, uh, Miss Finney. Yeah. I hate to start in running up expenses, but some of that rigging should be replaced. Okay. 
How much will it cost? Oh, just the price of new lines. Can you fix this soon? Right away. Huh? Here. Here's some dough for the stuff. Why, this is a $50 bill. <laughs> That's right. Did you ever see one before? Not for a long time. Well, I think I'll take a look around below. Uh, no, never mind that. Huh? Just go get those new lines so we'll be ready to go real quick, huh? Well, I... We'll meet you back here tomorrow morning. All right. Be here at 7. Yes, sir. So long, Captain. Goodbye, gentlemen. Uh, goodbye, Captain. Why did you get rid of him? Because the hole is full of supplies. Forgot to lock him up. If he saw him, he gets suspicious. Oh. I figured, let him think we're going on a fishing trip until we get started. Uh-huh. Well, we'd better get back up to the city and get those guns. <laughs> Special Agent Butler. Hello, Mark. This is Jim. I've got something. So have I. What? One of those phone numbers on my list turned out to be a place that rents trucks. Oh, that's probably where they got their transportation. Yeah. I checked the rental records on the dates that things were reported stolen, and the same man rented a truck every one of those days. Uh, what's his name? He rented in the name of Joe Brunswick, but the address he gave turned out to be a department store in Bay Harbor. Oh, the name must be a fake, too, then. That's my guess. However, I did get a description on the man, and I'm having it checked against the files. What was the description, Mark? 28 to 30 years old, Caucasian, 5 feet 9 or 10 inches tall, about 155 pounds, good shoulders, slight limp in left leg. Hey, I saw that man a couple of minutes ago. What? Yes, one of the phone numbers on my half of list turned out to be a warehouse. Oh? So I came over here to check. I saw a man answering that description enter the place just a couple of minutes ago. Where are you calling from? Candy store across the street from the warehouse. It's at... Uh... 719 West Montgomery Street. I'll be there as soon as I can, Jim. Okay, Mark. I'm going in now. That you, Pete? No. No, it isn't. Huh? What have you got in those cases? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. What are you doing here? This is a legitimate place. I didn't say it wasn't. I've got a search warrant here, and I asked you a question. What's in those cases? It's canned food. I don't know what kind. It ain't my job. Look, if you'll come back in the morning, the office can tell you. I got this warrant because I didn't want to wait until tomorrow morning. Now, are you going to open one of those cases, or do you want me to? I, I can't open anything here. I lose my job. Okay, then I'll open one. Oh, stay away from the crowbar. I'll pick it up myself. Look, I'll get fired for this, mister. You'll get more than that. You're under arrest. For what? This crate is full of guns. Guns? That's right. Mister, look, I only work here. I don't own that stuff. You think I open every crate that comes in here? I'd save that story if I were you, Brunswick. My name ain't Brunswick. I know. That's the name you used when you rented the truck. What truck? Oh, look, we can go into all this when we get downtown. Now, come on. Nice going, Pete. Let's move this stuff out of here. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Did you say independent 60s? Yes, Harry. It means complete financial independence after you're 60 years old. Sure, your children would take care of you, but isn't it better to be your own boss for life? You bet it is. To one man, independent 60s means carefree days in the great outdoors, listening to the sweetest music in the world, the whirl of a fishing reel after a big one is struck. 
to another man is getting in a family car and starting off on that long-awaited trip. Think of it, Madge. Yellowstone Park, the Grand Canyon, then Mexico. But whatever dream you may have of your independent 60s, remember this. Dreaming won't make it come true. After all, this matter is your job and nobody else's. So why not do something about it right now? Start by investigating the famous independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I always thought that a plan like that would run into more money than I could afford. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Harry, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between age 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts and figures. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Curious Cargo. The various crimes committed by the criminals in tonight's case should constitute a warning to all of us. For these are men who have banded together for the express purpose of breaking the law. One man, the watchman, has already taken his own life. Because when the pressure came, he found that he was on his own, that the loyalty he expected from his fellow criminals was not forthcoming. But although it is important for you to know that there is no such thing as loyalty among thieves, that is not the message your FBI wishes you to take away from this radio program. All over the nation, even as you are listening to this, there are men meeting and planning some illegal enterprise. For this is the time in history, this is the post-war period when gangsterism flourishes. Your FBI is fighting these gangsters and will continue to fight them, but it needs your help. You must see to it that your local police is a politically unhampered organization. And you must see to it that they are strong enough to meet the challenge. A challenge that must be met if we are to win the war against crime. Tonight's file continues in the emergency room of a local hospital. Well, Jim, how do you feel? Mm. Oh. oh, hello, Mark. You any better? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. This lady here trying to piece this thing together. How did I get here? Well, when I got to the warehouse, I found you on the floor. Oh. You remember anything that happened, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, I was just arresting that man I'd followed into the warehouse. Uh, one with a limp when somebody came up behind me. Knocked me out. <laughs> we had them, Mark. Uh, I let him get away. Oh, don't take it so hard. We'll catch up to him again. Yeah. Any new leads? No, well, not so far. But the office is working on the real estate records to see who owns that warehouse we found you in. Mm. Maybe that'll give us something to go on. Yeah. Mark, will you call the doctor? I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here in bed. I've me. already talked to that doctor, and you're to stay in bed. No, I don't get it. He said the pictures showed no fracture and no concussion, but you need rest. Oh, that's fine. I'm going back down to the office now, Jim. See if they've got anything on the owner of the warehouse. Now, look, Mark... I'll stop you... by here to see you this evening. Well, that you, Wayne? Yes, Mary. Have you been down to see the boat? Yes, well, for a man who's gone back to sea, you don't look very happy. I'm trying to make up my mind, Mary. About what? Whether to take this job or not. Why, what's the matter? Well... What is it, Wayne? I want to take the job, Mary, but there's a problem. Well, what is it? Well, I've come to the conclusion that they're not going fishing. But it is a fishing boat. What else would they want it for? I don't know. But when I went back aboard her this afternoon, I saw something I didn't like. 
Well, what was that? They had enough supplies on the boat to feed us for a month. We're supposed to go out for albacore. When they're running, you, you can fill a boat like that in two days. Oh. Another thing, I needed some money for repairs. One of the owners gave me a $50 bill. That reminded me too much of the men who used to come around here trying to rent boats during Prohibition. Well, you do whatever you like about it, Wayne. This may be my last chance for a boat, Mary. Wayne, if you're talking this over with me to get my advice, I'd say tell them you don't want the boat. Thank you, Mary. When I see them tomorrow morning, I'm saying I quit. <laughs> Special Agent Butler speaking. Hello, Mark. This is Jim. Jim? I'm just about to leave the hospital. You're what? I'm getting out of here. Now, look, look, I'm all right now. Now, What did you find out on the warehouse? Well, the reports show that it was leased in the dead watchman's name. Great. That puts us right back where we started. Yeah, I'm afraid so. You know, while I was getting dressed, I kept thinking about that fake address in Bay Harbor given by the man who rented the truck. What about it? Well, there's just a chance that he and his confederate are really in Bay Harbor. Mark, the office hasn't taken me off this case because of the accident, has it? No. Oh, that's fine. And there are a couple of things I'd like you to do for me. Name them. Will you get two John Doe warrants? Okay. And will you call the local police at Bay Harbor, tell them what's happened, and give them a description, too? Right. We'll get down to Bay Harbor first thing in the morning and look around. <laughs> Well, Joe, we've got everything in the hold now. I thought we'd never get finished. What time is that captain coming? He ought to be here any time now. Why? Well, we want to get out of here with the rest of the boats, and they're getting ready to leave at noon. Look, why do we want to leave with the rest of the boats? Nobody will notice us. So when we get outside the harbor, we can start south. How long will it take us to get there, Pete? Uh, about two weeks in this thing. Oh, yeah. hmm? oh. Hi, Captain. Come on board. I'm coming. Boat here. Well, you ready to go, Captain? No, I'm not. Well, how soon can you be? Well, I've been thinking about this, and I know I promised you I'd skip the boat, but I'm afraid you'll have to count me out. What? Well, now, wait a minute. It's a little late for that. You can get another captain. In fact, old Cap Warwick has no ship. We want you. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but I've already made up my mind. So have I. What are you doing with that gun? Take one guess. Now, are you going with us or not? I'm not. Take him below, Joe. When he comes to, he'll change his mind. Good hunch you had, Jim, going to the lunchroom. Well, at least we know that the man with the limp has been in town and that he talked to Captain Stevens. I hope Stevens is at home. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be a tough boat to find, Jim. Did you see how many there were in the harbor? Yeah, and they all look the same. Well, I guess that's the Stevens shack right here on the left. Yeah, it looks like the place was described to us. You go ahead, Mark. I'll slide out on your side. Okay, Jim. Mac it? Yeah, that's fine. You suppose that woman hanging laundry out there is Mrs. Stevens? Well, let's find out, huh? Pardon me. Are you Mrs. Stevens? Well, yes, I am. Well, we're special agents of the FBI, Mrs. Stevens. Here are my credentials. This is Agent Butler. Uh, what do you want? Well, we came to see your husband. Is he at home? Uh, no, he's not. He went down to see two men who wanted him to work on their boat. Uh, did one of the men have a slight limp in one leg? Well, yes, I believe Wayne did mention that. You know the name of the boat, Mrs. Stevens? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but if you wait, the captain will be back soon. He went down to tell the two men that he didn't want to work for them. You see, he was suspicious of them. What was he suspicious of? But he didn't think they were really going fishing. Well, he's right. The whole of that boat is full of stolen goods. Oh, heavens. Captain Stevens told him his suspicions. There might be trouble, Jim. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Mark. Oh. Mrs. Stevens, is it true that all the boats are going out at noon? Yes, a word came in that there's a run to Albacore and they'll all go out with the tide. 
Well, that throws out the possibility of searching every boat. There just wouldn't be time, even with a dozen men. But they won't be back for three days. Tell me, is that all the time that any of the boats stay out? When the Albacore are running, yes. Mm-hmm. Have you phoned Mrs. Stevens? No, we haven't. Oh, I see. Well, if you'll excuse us, we'll go into the village and find one. Come on, Mark, I've got an idea. <laughs> Keep working on him. We gotta get started pretty soon. All right. Come on, come on. Come on. Here, throw this water in his kisser. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Come on, come on, come on Cap. Get with it, will you? Come on. Uh, all right. Can you hear me? Yes. Those cases over there are full of guns, and we gotta get them out of here. You said you knew the water's down south. Well, you're gonna get a chance to prove it. I'm not going. Mister would be crazy to let you walk off this boat alive, and we're not going to. But you can't... Why not? Who's going to stop us? We are. Huh? Yeah. Hold it. What? Just both of them, Mark. Right, Jim. Wait, the cops. Special agents of the FBI. We got warrants here for the arrest of both of them. Okay, Mark, take them above. Right. All right, you do. Up you go. All right. I didn't have anything to do with those guns. Well, we know that, Captain Stevens. How do you know my name? Oh, we've been to your house. We saw Mrs. Stevens. She doesn't know it yet, but she's the one who sent us down here. But she didn't even know the name of the boat, did she? No, but she knew enough to tell us that the rest of those boats would only be out three or four days. So I checked the supply stores. This boat took on enough supplies for a month. That's when I knew this had to be the boat we wanted. Now, come on up on deck with me, Captain Stevens. We're taking those men into custody. Joe Finney and Pete Jones were sentenced to 10 years each for theft of government property. And so your FBI was able to prevent the crime of stealing government property from being compounded by the two criminals in tonight's case. For it was their intention to sell those guns to insurrectionists in a Latin American country that men they never saw would die because of their sale of those stolen goods meant nothing to this pair. In fact, it never entered their minds. For the attitude of criminals towards others is what must have inspired the phrase, man's inhumanity to man. Thus, once again, your FBI closed the careers of a pair of sadistic lawbreakers and not only protected the security of you, the American people, but also the security of people in a distant foreign land. On such protection as that is founded the reputation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation of your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan. Are these plans flexible, Mr. Keating? Can the amount be increased if my income goes up in the next five years? It certainly can. Your Equitable Society representative will tell you that many successful men have done exactly that. What about my present life insurance? Your Equitable representative will show you how your present insurance gives you a head start on this plan. What income will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story of the short criminal career of two youthful female bandits. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Phantom Bandit. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bantam Bandits on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.